I have one memory of my father during the time when my parents were married. I was about two or three years old and he and I were driving in our 1974 VW Beetle. He was behind the steering wheel and I had assumed my typical position of standing up in the passenger seat while the vehicle was in motion. <laughs> Yay for early 80s road safety. <laughs> I remember feeling that our time together was limited. I remember asking him if he was leaving. I don't remember what he said in response. Soon after, he was gone. The next memory I have of my father comes to me courtesy of Pacific Southwest Airlines. <laughs> I began my solo flights on PSA at the age of five, when my mother decided that it was time that my father and I had a relationship. Twice yearly, I would board the plane with my pink jacket and my red blankie and fly one hour north to the strange and foreign tundra of the Bay Area <laughs> to visit my father and stepmother. The isolation and low rumbles of anxiety I felt on these solo flights will always be branded into my memory alongside the vivid hues of PSA airline seat upholstery, a design clearly inspired by the sophisticated color palette of Starburst candy wrappers. <laughs> that first time I flew solo into San Francisco, my dad was late getting to the airport to pick me up. Consequently, my memory of this experience as a five-year-old involves an irritated model-like flight attendant handing me the receiver of a payphone to call him, followed by long walks through the bowels of the airport as she collected my luggage and waited with me for him to arrive. This adventure mostly involved me trying to make awkward conversation while keeping up with the long strides of the irritated runway model. Plus side, I got a lot of pins with wings on them that day. Needless to say, my dad and I weren't super tight growing up. In an effort of pure overcompensation for the divorce, my mom had basically defined parenting as unconditional cheerleading. And since my dad was prone to neither effusive enthusiasm nor really any knowledge about what was going on in my life, I had trouble reading his subtler attempts at father-daughter bonding. Also, my stepmother's perspective on the whole situation was less than ideal. Her constant analysis of my general existence was a running passive aggressive commentary on the inferiority of my mother's parenting. It was as if there was some crazy competition going on between them that existed entirely inside of my stepmother's head and I had to blindly navigate the invisible minefield she had created. And now, a wilderness survival guide to stepmother minefield navigation <laughs> for kids. Number one, don't talk about your mother, especially if any of the conversation causes your father to wax poetic about their first apartment together or their romantic outings feeding seagulls or, you know, your birth. <laughs> Number two, don't talk about your educational philosophies, especially if you get good grades. Do you think that makes you better than everyone else? Why do you talk about books all the way, all the time? Anyway, it's weird. Number three, don't admit to not being able to cook. Your upbringing will be blamed and denounced. Secretly try to remember that you are not in fact a bad person for not being able to bake a pie. <laughs> the same goes for sewing, gardening, and pinochle. <laughs> Number four, do try to downplay the fact that you're a Catholic because it means you're the wrong kind of Christian. Go with your stepmother to her church, hang out with the church kids, Keep in mind, if you mention the word psychic in any context, you will be subjected to home Bible study focused on verses condemning fortune tellers. <laughs> Number five, don't talk too much about things you are excited about. If they even remotely point to a talent or skill you are exploring as you grow up, you are not the center of attention. No one cares that much, and acting is weird. <laughs> also, theater is something your mom did, so see rule number one. <laughs> number six, do be as helpful as possible. Maybe if you do the dishes, your stepmother will like you more. Number seven, if it all becomes too much, naps and books are valuable escape pods. I spent most of my time navigating this minefield, so it was challenging to find the time to get to know my dad, who was sort of awkward and elusive and quiet. 
So when I was around 14 and I came downstairs one day during a visit and found my dad watching television, I knew I had an opportunity. The house rule was generally that if one could be outside playing tennis or croquet or at the table playing cards with the family, one shouldn't be watching TV. So to see my father enjoying some crazy sci-fi show mid-afternoon, well, I knew my stepmother must be out of the house. I didn't care what was on TV, I jumped at the chance to share something with my dad. So I joined him and tuned in to my first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> I can divide my life into roughly two sections. <laughs> life before and life after falling in love with Wesley Crusher. <laughs> hey, handsome. <laughs> Wesley Crusher was cute. Wesley Crusher was smart. Wesley Crusher was adorably awkward. If at 14 I didn't know that hot nerd was my ideal romantic dating type, I was about to find out. <laughs> my curiosity peaked. I began to lean in with my dad as we watched that afternoon, our stolen time full of conversation around Android Man and reading Rainbow Guy and <laughs> dad's secret crush on the Betazoid goddess. <laughs> Watching this show together that day and a few more days throughout that visit was a gift. It was an hour of time when I didn't have to second guess my place in his life or dodge passive aggressive comments slung from my stepmother. Hurtling through space, I didn't have to worry about saying the wrong things or rehashing the past or defending parts of my life I had no control over. The cloud that perpetually lingered over my relationship with my father seemed to lift in the 24th century. <laughs> this is the moment when I became a sci-fi fan. I became obsessed with the series and watched it religiously from that moment forward. Back at home, I familiarized myself with the intricacies of the characters and past storylines, the injustice of Tasha Yar's pointless death in season one, and <laughs> the bravery of episodes about non-binary sexual orientation. I, I relished Guinan's wisdom and questioned Data's holodeck story choices. <laughs> and with each passing episode, my true love for Wesley Crusher blossomed and deepened. I began writing scenes for episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, <laughs> which would feature me as a guest star and love interest for this adorable and super smart bachelor in uniform. In one scene, I was an alien princess with a secret power which would be confessed to Wesley during our illicit love affair and bond us forever. In another episode, I was a general's daughter weighed down by the duties which would one day befall me. In another, I was a diplomat, the youngest ever in the history of the Federation, but my powers meant that I would one day be forced to sacrifice my life force. I can love you today, Wesley Crusher, <laughs> but my people will need me to love them forever. <laughs> I would say to him, and he would nod empathetically as we tucked ourselves into secret rendezvous near holodeck waterfalls, the star-escaped picture windows of 10 forward, or the engineering warp coil. <laughs> the characters I wrote always had their own minefields to navigate, just like me, but Wesley was always there to offer kindness and acceptance, the kind I had been looking for. It was therapeutic as a teenager to write into a world where I had someone who understood me. The next time I went for a dad visit, I had my arsenal of Star Trek facts at the ready, eager to engage in all sorts of sci-fi nerdery with him. I hopped into the car at the airport and immediately started to trekkie gush. <laughs> but dad had lost interest in the show. Not for me, he said. Too out there. We rode the rest of the way in near silence as I fought back stupid tears of disappointment. There. Again, in the passenger seat of a moving vehicle. Even though my father abandoned his Star Trek fandom, I had become completely invested. My love for Wesley Crusher morphed into an uber fangirl crush on Will Wheaton, and throughout high school, I continued writing scenes featuring me as the love interest of the plethora of characters he played in the 90s. 
Okay, maybe it was just Toy Soldiers with Sean Astin. <laughs> My Will Wheaton crush became a fun and quirky trait I've held on to over the years. When he became the nerd representative of the world through his stints on Big Bang Theory and other projects, I noted, with a small deflation in my heart, that he had married his gorgeous wife, Anne. She sponsors events for the Humane Society. It's hard to hate her. <laughs> Warp speed to 2014, and I would actually meet the two of them in a Stone Brewery Comic-Con Woot Stout-related bout of intoxication. <laughs> Because Will Wheaton and I are totally connected and I stalk him online fairly regularly, <laughs> I, I had discovered and empathized with his struggle with depression, something I had also been working through that year. Anne had also written a blog about living with someone who suffered from depression, and both were very transparent about their challenges and coping strategies. Because of Will Wheaton, I learned as a teenager that writing was my coping strategy and I had worked through my depression via a collection of poems. Upon reading Anne's blog, I emailed her and asked if I could send her a copy of my book. <laughs> to her credit, she kindly emailed me back with her mailing address and notified me that she had received it. But she didn't send me a response to the book, so I was a bit hesitant to approach the two of them at a private tasting party at Stone Brewery. <laughs> I just happened to stumble into. <laughs> Okay, full disclosure, I worked at SeaWorld with the brewery safety manager when I was 19 and he totally texted me the moment he found out that this non-publicized event was happening. <laughs> I have spies everywhere. <laughs> After a few glasses of that year's batch of Wootstout and with my friend Kristen's prodding, I found my courage. Will was chatting with some lame Uber fan. <laughs> So we waved to get Anne's attention. Clearly unused to people wanting to fangirl her, she approached and introduced herself. I made nervous small talk before bringing up her blog and admitting that I had sent her my book. You wrote creepy little death poems, she said. I nodded. And then, I watched in slow motion as she turned to Will Wheaton and said, Honey, this is the girl who wrote the death poems. Which is never in a million years how I thought I would be introduced to Will Wheaton. But be still, my 14-year-old heart, he broke away from his conversation, locked eyes with me, did a little happy dance that could only look cool on a hot nerd and said, I love your book. <laughs> Everything sort of went blurry at that point. And I'd like to imagine that we talked about something really cool, like the power of art to work through dark times. But I mostly just tried to remember how to speak. Eventually, another lame Uber fan demanded their attention. So I thanked them for reading my book and excused myself so I could go gleefully squeal with abandon in some isolated corner of the restaurant <laughs> with Kristen. But as we parted ways, I couldn't help but glance at Will and say in my head, or quite possibly out loud because Wootstout has like 13% alcohol content, <laughs> thank you Wesley Crusher for always understanding me. That was the Uber Minship Super Fans Tiffany Tang!